person that needs no introduction, our mayor, right. Raj J. Baraka, representing the Howard University, the other H. Share a little bit about yourself, please. Okay, quickly. Good evening. Yeah. I am Dr. Karma Brown Warren. I am a Brick City daughter who attended Tuskegee University. I am an emergency medicine trauma doctor who worked right up the street at University Hospital in Newark for the last 20 years. I currently work on venous insufficiency with veins. And I represent, like I said, the Tuskegee University Tigers, baby. So good evening, everyone. My name is Brielle Lewis. I'm currently the Director of Sponsorship Strategy with Prudential Financial. I see so many Hamptonians in the crowd. And I look, listen, we show up. I don't see no Howard shirts, man. Jersey alumni chapter of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. I'm sorry, Sora, so am I. I was invited like you, Ray. Well, I'm the mayor of the city of North, the largest city of the city. Born and raised in the city of Newark all my life. I went to Howard University, the real HU. You know. And uh, I am a member of our five fraternity incorporated, the oldest and the coldest. Hey, boy! <laughs> Easy there, Larry. We never have. Let us stay focused. Let us stay focused. Just a couple, couple other quick items before we get started with the questions. Is, shared with you that I went to Hampton University. Uh, you should know that uh, both of my daughters attended and graduated from Hampton University. And I would be remiss if I didn't take the time. First, I want you to if you reflect back in the early part of the documentary. It kind of showed an area that was overlooking a bay and a big clock over these, at the top of a, a chapel. Well, 35 years ago today, I married this young lady, Dr. Dion Ledford, who was over in the crowd someplace. And she was another Hampton University graduate. So we're celebrating our 35th anniversary with you all. And I'm happy to be that young. Happy to be that All right, so let's get it. So, first question is, why is it that you attended an HBCU? Brielle? Um, so I attended an HBCU. It was not in my plans at all. I didn't even know, frankly, what an HBCU was. I don't have a lot of family members, like uh, Calvin talked about, having a legacy of HBCU um, attendance. That, that just wasn't my story. But I did have a best friend who, and this is why it's so important that people you surround yourselves with, especially when you're making life decisions like this. Um, but her brother went to North Carolina A&T. And we had decided that we were gonna apply to all of the same schools. And whatever schools that we both got into, those are the ones we would consider attending. And so we both got into Hampton and we went and saw the campus. And it was, I saw the water, I was over there, you know, we have 12 to two every Friday, it's a party every Friday on campus. They had a five year MBA program. I knew that I wanted to go into business. Not only did they have that program, that program had 99% job placement, meaning everybody leaves here with a job. And the minimum salary was $65,000. And so I'm like, if that is, if I know I'm gonna get a job, and I'm gonna make at least 65, I'm gonna be all right. I'm gonna be okay, but again, the people you surround yourself with are so important because I initially just wanted to go to Montclair State or Union County College because that's where all of my classmates were going. And so I wanted to go to the 13th grade with them. But I had to, <laughs> y'all caught that a little late, y'all caught that a little late, y'all caught that a little late. Um, but that is why I wanted to go to HBCU. And then again, you get there, I never met black people from Wisconsin. I never, I didn't know what the D 
DMV was. I have never been exposed to true black wealth, right? You come from legacy, your family owns boats, you're at Martha's Vineyard every summer. Um, and it just was this utopia that I just had to be a part of. I appreciate that. Dr. K. Well, I tell you, my story is a little different. I grew up in a household where my mother said, I'm only paying for you to go to an end in case you. So I didn't have a choice. But I had an uncle who was an electrical engineer who uh, graduated from Tuskegee University. And I wanted to be like him. So I attended Tuskegee University with the thought of being like my uncle. So I majored in electrical engineering and I graduated in electrical engineering. So I wanted to be like him who was a vice president at Hewlett Packard. And I knew I could get that from Tuskegee because he got it. And when I graduated Tuskegee, I had 13 job offers. So that's why I went to Tuskegee. All right. Well, I'm married a child I knew about. Uh, <laughs> HBCUs and Howard specifically. My dad went to Howard for a little while, uh, but I still wasn't convinced. Uh, and I thought I was a little hard-headed as a young man. Um, I was on my way to University High School, which is where I went to high school in Newark. It was down the street from my house, uh, which means I was late every day. <laughs> and uh, you know, while I was walking to school one day, there was a bus in front, and the kids were getting on the bus. Rosita Holiday, who was the guidance counselor then said to me, oh, you're supposed to be on this trip. And I'm smart out. I said, no, I'm not. She said, yes, you are. I said, I don't have a permission slip, so I can't go. So I meandered in the building, went to my homeroom class. They called my name on the loudspeaker to come to the office. I come to the office. She's on the phone with my father. <laughs> She's like, here goes your permission. <laughs> so I, I got on the bus. I went to Howard University, and I just fell in love as soon as I walked on the campus. Uh, it was just an amazing experience for me that day, just talking to kids and other young people. They were studying math and science and astronomy and all kinds of things. And I was like, wow, uh, this is amazing to me. And I made a decision that I would only fill out one college application. And I always tell kids not to do what I did. <laughs> I filled out one college application. That was to Howard University. I was determined to go to Howard. And God is good because I graduated from Howard University. That's right. That's right. Let's stay with that a So both of, all of you expressed um, information about your decision. And with pride, all of you were speaking about uh, how you had a good time there. But let me, let me tighten the question up a little bit. Um, did it actually meet your expectations? Can you speak to that a little bit? It exceeded my expectations. OK. Um, when I got to Hampton, again, even at that time, Hampton had a reputation of being a little bit of a party school. Like, you're going to go here, you're going to go to block parties, you're going to go to Holland Hall, you're going to be in the student center, homecoming is exciting. But when you get to Hampton's campus in your freshman year, you're on curfew for the first 10 weeks of school. Oh, you got to tighten up. Okay, okay? And, and you have to be in by 11 on the weekdays and one on the weekends, um, it really creates this structure of balance automatically from your freshman year. It is kicked off like, I am not just here to party and meet people and you know meet a husband or something. You know, I am really here to get an education and to be able to thrive. So far exceeded my expectations. All of my best friends are all came from Hampton. We all met that first year in Moton Hall. Um, on our fourth floor, and I just, I, I could not have had a better experience um, at Hampton. I have to echo that, but I didn't really have that expectation because I went to the Deep South. So first, for me, coming into the South, it was like people on the porches waving at me as I was coming down the street. I was like, whoa, what is this going to be like? But then I realized not long that it was a big family like I mean literally like everybody is there to see your growth and to see you succeed I mean I had the home numbers to my professors right. when I had questions I could call them and say I don't know what I'm doing with this project I mean it was it was one-on-one -on -one attention and it was a expectation for me to excel and so what it did for me which I didn't realize when I interned at General Motors in the summertime with the students from MIT and from all the other schools I didn't feel inferior 
I didn't feel like I knew anything less than they did, although I probably did. I wasn't gonna let them know that I knew that, right? Because this is what that school fostered in me, a confidence to be in that environment. No matter what I knew, no matter what I was, I was gonna succeed. And that's what these professors and the teachers in the environment at, the, at Tuskegee did for me. So I didn't have that expectation, but it worked. Interesting. I studied under Ron Walters, who was Jesse Jackson's campaign manager in political science. I was in class with Jelani Cobb, uh, you know, talking about history and, and, and debating Kasim Reed uh, in business and politics classes. You know, so, I mean, in my experience at Howard was tremendous. I had a teacher, Dr. Taylor, who made me do a 25-page paper and went and accepted it when I turned it in. He told me I had to do it over because I was smarter than that and made me do the paper again, and gave me a C <laughs> on the second one, right? So that was, that's, that was what was going on at Howard for me. Besides the great time I had, you know, it was a very serious academic place, that's for sure. That's for sure, and, 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 and they all are. You know, it's interesting. I, I asked you that question about expectations because, quite frankly, it was different for me personally, right? I had no expectations. I was actually the first on both sides to go to school. So winding up at Hampton, I didn't know what to expect, right? So everything was uplift for me. Everything's up. So I got another one for you. Uh, let's talk about your experience as a student there. Did it have an impact on you being an advocate for social justice and civil rights? Mayor, won't you take that one first? <laughs> uh, no, no, yeah, absolutely. Uh, I was a writer. Like, you know, I used to write poetry and hide it in my back pocket on Avon Avenue on 14th Street because I couldn't pull out a poem in front of you so I was thinking to you. Like, yo, y'all want to hear this poem? <laughs> it just wouldn't, it wouldn't pan out. It right, it might have been a little, you know, it going saw you a little different. Right, so when I, when I got to Howard, like, I was able to go to my first poetry readings, first events, be able to read uh, poetry, uh, join an organization called Black United Youth, began to study, you know, incredible books that, um, you know, I saw in my house but never read. And so when I got a chance to see them, I got an opportunity to begin reading and studying and learning these things. And we started our own organization as a result of that called Neo Force that we created there, uh, mainly of inner city young men and women from Baltimore, Cleveland, New York, Newark, who all Philadelphia came together and tried to make some changes. While I was at Howard, we took over the administration building for three or four days. I was one of those people you see up there protesting, right? So we took over the administration building because Lee Atwater, who was the head of the Republican National Committee then, who had the Willie Horton ad, who put it out and said, because they furloughed black men, you know, was trying to paint this like racist and race baiting kind of ad. So we protested and we stayed in the building for four days. So my whole uh, experience as an activist began and took root at Howard University, the studying, the organizing, the meetings, all of those things. So when I came back to Newark, it was just second nature for me to continue the things that I began at Howard. Continue to struggle. So it's, it's interesting, you, you, you make me reflect during the time that I was in Hampton, it was about that vesting in South Africa. That's what I was just going to say, that's what it was at Tuskegee when we took over the building as well. It was about divesting in South Africa. And that was my freshman year. And I remember them taking over that building and camping out in the Kresge Hall for like four days. I mean, literally took over that. And that was my introduction in college, but as my mother grew up with, and you know, very active in Newark, I've been around that all my life. But I was able to continue that at Tuskegee. So um, while I was at Hampton, I was the NAACP president for three straight years. And during my tenure as the NAACP president, Trayvon Martin was murdered, Mike Brown was murdered. Um, and you can, not imagine the tension that that causes on HBCU campus. Um, and we wanted to meet with our local mayor and with our fire chief and with our police chief to have a conversation about what we were gonna do with, within the city to have a better relationship with the police department because we didn't have the greatest at the time. Um, they declined the meeting. And so I led, thankfully we had a national board member from the NAACP that was based in Virginia. So we had very strong backing. We actually shut down the bridge and marched from campus from President Harvey's house across the bridge to the mayor's office 
and shut down the entire bridge that connects downtown Hampton to the university, which also connects to the main highway. Think of it of like the, the turnpike of Virginia 64. Um, and we had a meeting that next day. They actually came and spoke at that rally at the end because I don't think they thought students in this day and time were going to organize like like our you know and ancestors and like our the ones that came before us and so that was um, impactful but also uh, as president NAACP I got to go to DC a lot I was big on lobbying um, going to Congress to have conversations about the Voting Rights Act when I became president they were actually repealing a key piece of the formula of the Voting Rights Act. Exactly. Um, and so we were up there having powerful conversations um, as students. So it wasn't just the administration talking, and I feel like it, it had a deeper impact because you have these um, you know, senators that are deep red states, right, who don't really want to hear us, but we're so articulate, and we're so well-spoken, and we're put together, and we're educated, and we have our facts. And guess what? I also have the NAACP president sitting here behind me. Um, and so that was my experience doing that. And again, you can't do, I had people, friends at Montclair State and Keene calling me like, how can I do something like that? I'm like, listen, you got to have a lot of political backing to be able to do things like that. But when you have conversations and when you talk to your leaders and you show up serious about business, they will back you as they did us. For real. You know, you heard it in all the stories here. Um, we just watched a documentary and a, 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 a lot of that information had to do with organizing and demonstrating and, and fighting for social justice and environmental justice. It's still occurring on HBCU campuses today. Right? It's still occurring today. So if you didn't know that, it's not just yesterday. It's not just yesterday. You know, Mayor, you talked about uh, uh, an organization that um, you and some of your colleagues and fellow students at the time um, started. So uh, some of mine started one as well. It just wasn't quite as politically correct as yours. It was a chapter of Animal House and that we started back in 19... Do you remember the, you know... So, it was, a, it, was a little bit, it was a little bit different than yours. A little bit different. A little bit different. So, next question. So, now let's think about this from the perspective of people will choose, students will choose HBCUs. Why is choosing the right HBCU based on your career choice important? Dr. K, why don't you take that first? <laughs> um, I think it's really important. I, I, I would love for every student to go to an HBCU. I think it's awesome. I think you also have to think about what you want to do. Some schools are stronger in some curriculums than others, right? So for me, electrical engineering, it was North Carolina a t or Tuskegee because I knew that that is their strength. That's what they're going to be imponing in me to make sure that I succeed. Whereas if you want to do something like business, communications, you need to look at how, you need to look at the schools and their curriculums and see as far as job potential, what they have for you. That doesn't negate any of the smaller schools or make a change for that. But if it's something that you know that's what your major is, you need to make sure that you research that school and make sure that you know about that HBCU and what they can offer for you. It's very important. You can graduate from an HBCU and still not have a job. So you want to make sure you graduate and have some place to go. And when me and my best friend were looking at HBCUs, initially we both loved Spelman, right? The thought of going to a place where beautiful black women get to thrive and be smart and wonderful. But they didn't have a school of business. And I knew I wanted to go into business. So I had to make the decision to say, yeah, I think I want to go to this school. But if I go to school, I got a major in math. And I don't like math. So um, I'm going to go to Hampton where they have a five-year MBA program. I also knew I did not want to go back to school. I wanted to do school once. So I wanted to do a five-year MBA program, which Hampton and FAMU were the two five-year MBA programs in the HBCU um, uh, ecosystem. And so that's how I made my decision. But again, if you want to be in tech, you need to be going to a and It's not just enough to say, I want to go to an HBCU. You still need to be able to let your life do the singing, right, as you move on from your HBCU. So you need to make smart career choices. If you can't make a decision, you should just go to Howard. <laughs> 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 I'm saying. <laughs> Amen. When I when I first started, I was undecided. I wasted a lot of money. I was undecided, and, uh, and I, I was wanted, thought I was going to be a communications major. 
and I wound up studying political science and history. And my guidance counselor said, you took so many history classes when you were undecided, you might as well have a double major. So I wound up graduating with a double major in political science and history. But uh, I would agree that you need to identify what it is that you want to do uh, early on, if you, if you can. And, and the, the only thing that sometimes that changes uh, in your, your effort, you know, and you might get into a place and realize that you thought you wanted to do something and you realize that this is not exactly what you want to do. Because somebody described it to you a little differently when you was a kid. And when you finally realize, you say, hey, this is not, this is not it. This is not it. So, uh, you know, just, I, I would say be very thoughtful about that and, and not be afraid if you have to pivot. You know, you just have to have some counseling around you so you pivot correctly and not waste a lot of money and a lot of time. Absolutely, you know, in, in, inside of that comment, um, as you're developing, I mean, it's one of the key things when I do speak with people about HBCUs, you know. If you want your child to be someplace where somebody is going to care about them personally, somebody's gonna care about their well-being, give them sound guidance um, when they're doing well, and more importantly, when they're not doing well. You want to consider an HBCU. You want to consider an HBCU because it's like a family, as we all know. It's a little different than I think when all of us went to school because when we went to school, we could not be in the opposite de sex dorm after a certain time. Like it was just, I still remember Miss Crenshaw, get in there, get in the dorm, you know. Literally, we had an environment that already started from the moment you stepped on that campus for success. And it started with structure. So, you know, that, that is what the HBCUs provided for us. Structure from the very beginning. So, so stay there a minute. You talked about structure, but share a little bit, share some thoughts about um, how going to Tuskegee um, shaped your personal identity. That's a good question. Uh, so I grew up here in Newark, obviously, and um, I think there is a, um, an, I guess people think people from the North are a little rude, a little brute. And so um, I may have been a little rough around the edges. <laughs> and, uh, assertive, but, assertive. <laughs> assertive. And so um, going to the South really changed me into what I call almost a, like a Southern Belle in some way, um, to the sense where um, I walk in the grocery store, I speak to everybody now, you know. Whereas when I first went down, it was like, you don't know me, you, you don't know my name. But now that you're down there, I mean, it just changes the person that you are. You just become a people lover, you become, a, a, a want to have a family. And so that branches out into every being and everything that I involve myself in. So I will see myself transition to the type of person that was different than I would have been had I stayed here in the room. Can I, I want to jump on that. When I, when I went to college, I was really trying to run away from the shadow of my dad and all of that. So I thought I was going to be able to go to Howard and just chill out and have a good time, you know? And, and I, I did that, by the way. But I, I thought, you know, I really was doing that. And I ran into uh, a gentleman, you, you, I know you guys know Ta-Nehisi Coates, right? But his father is Paul Coates, who was the director of the Bull and Spingarn Library, which is the largest library in the world, buying about black people, goes back and forth with the Schomburg in New York. He was the director of that. He introduced me to the shopper. I mean, introduced me to Lauren Spingarn. And they, they had uh, this kind of study room downstairs. And, and he would bring me all of these documents and all of these uh, primary documents that I could read. And, and I, would, I would go down there and read that stuff over and over and over again. So it's, it's almost like I went there to run away and ran into it. And Paul Coates uh, published some of my father's early works. Right, so he had a vested interest, and in I thought my father called him, by the way, but he had a vested interest in making sure that you know I was successful uh, down there, and just my trying to run away from that, running to that, just really broadened my ability to study and focus, and made me embrace the thing that I thought uh, you know was not going to be my identity. It became who I actually was. Yeah, for for me. Um, I just really 
I didn't see a light in myself that my professors and the people around me saw in me. So as far as shaping me as a person, they took it almost as their personal job. How do we help cultivate Brielle and help her realize this gift that she has? I remember I had, she's now the dean of the School of Business, Dean Hayes. She pulled me into her office and she said, you know, your height. There's so many things about you, but that was one thing that she would say, no, I need you to stand in front of the classroom and I need you to make this announcement and I need you to do this and I need you to be a presence and a, and a strong leadership presence among your class. But putting, I'm like, I'm a freshman, I just got here. I'm trying to go out. I'm not trying to make sure these, at Hampton School of Business, you really, we take dressing seriously. I mean, it is black suit, navy suit, hosiery, they don't care if it's 90 degrees outside. She's asking me to tell my classmates to put, they gotta leave the classroom because they don't have a whole room. Why me, Dr. Hayes? But she's, just not her, all of the leaders around you saw something special in all of us. So it, I'm telling you this story, but every single one of my classmates is gonna tell you the same story about how they saw the thing in them that they said, no, we're gonna cultivate that in Bria. We're gonna cultivate that in Khaled, and it just, shaped me as a person so much. I tell people I would not be who I am without Hampton University and the School of Business, not even close to it. I wouldn't be as outspoken, as opinionated, um, or any of the things that I am. So it helped shape me as a person tremendously. So, so let, me, let me follow up with that. So, so you spoke about how a professor there helped to bring you out, led into you talking about you, you, how it's impacted your identity. Talk about how your time at Hampton um, has been woven into your life today, whether it's at work, in your community, whether it's a church or working with a nonprofit. Talk about how uh, uh, your experience at Hampton is still part of your daily life today. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Ooh, so I have, in the five-year MBA program, you have to take a class called Kendo. It's a Japanese art and you gotta put on these robes and you gotta have these sticks and you're in class fighting. And as you're fighting, you're saying these, um, what we call isms, and there's 12 of them. Things like think, move, exercise caution in economic affairs, reach back while climbing, give credit where credit is due. And there are these things that they are like hammering into your brain. And it's funny now because I go in meetings um, and I have to tell you, like my Caucasian peers, I was like, can I write? No, you cannot write that down. That's not for you. But I really walk through my life. Let me, I, reach back while climbing is their favorite. I saw someone put it on LinkedIn the other day and I'm gonna get with them um, when I see them. But, uh, but it is really something that I live by, right? Like I go to Hampton at least three times a year and I am present on campus. We have Prudential Fellows who get $10,000 scholarships and mentorships and get uh, easier access. This is, um, but things like, I take reaching back while climbing seriously. I taking exercise, caution, and economic affairs seriously. I had a mentor that once told me, your plan out of corporate America is financial freedom. And our school of business dean also was very serious about that, about us getting life insurance about us buying annuities when we, who thinks of an annuity at 18? Um, and so there were all of these isms and ways of being, which they changed from ways of doing business to just how you should be. You should give credit where credit is due. If someone came up with an idea in a meeting, you should say, Calvin, that was Calvin's thing. You should think, but you only move after you think. So there was like this whole order, and I take that with me everywhere and again i use it in meetings all of the time they love it or little hashtags but it, it really is a, a way of being and a way of moving and it's not something that you just do for your four years at hampton um and it's something that hampton university i think is holds us accountable for right for reaching back while climbing for making sure we're ex exercising economic affairs so that we can give back to our university because when we talk about those universities closing you know where the major uh funders of hbcu hbcus are us alumni coming and giving back our money if i don't ex exercise caution economic affairs how can i have my dollars to give my 186 dollars to hampton every month or my my bonus donation that i do um every year so those are a couple of my would anybody else like to comment? No, 
Now she 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 summed it up. <laughs> she summed it up. Uh, no, but you 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 mentioned something that's in, in important and near and dear to me. You're talking about um, helping the students, right? Um, I know you were Prudential and and you're a big supporters, big supporters of Hampton, and I, I appreciate that. You know. Um, I got into my role as the president of a foundation maybe a little more than five years ago. Um, and it was a personal mission of mine. If I don't do another thing uh, while I'm the foundation president, I'm going to find a way to get some dollars to some HBCUs. Unfortunately, strong board, um, I was in a position uh, back in 2021 uh, to give a million dollars to Hampton, Howard, and North Carolina a and uh, And we're looking to continue that. We're looking to continue that. That's right. That's my right. Son from Howard graduate. Got a job with us. Yes, intern with us. Yes, he did. Absolutely. I do give him a hard time about Howard, though. You know, like, I give him a hard time. <laughs> So I got one for us. Let's talk about the response and reactions to the challenges that we get about the quality of education at HBCUs. Any comments you want to make when people uh, may try to imply that it's inferior to the Ivy League? I would say Margaret the King Thurgood Marshall, Charles Hamilton Houston, George Washington Carver, you know, all, all of these people, Booker T. Washington. I would go Ernest Just, go on and go Mary McLeod Bethune, so sweet potato pies to build a college for girls that turn into Bethune Cookman. These are serious people with serious ideas that shape this country for generations. And we are just lucky to be on the campus to bask in that history every day, all day. Uh, and that shadow that we stand under fuels us and gives us the spirit to continue that legacy and do incredible, magnificent things. Everybody I know that went to Howard University felt obligated when they left to make something transformative happen. Yeah, that's powerful. So, you know, as a part of Hampton's alma mater, we talk about letting our life do the singing, right? So whenever people ask me, because I get it all the time, why didn't you go Ivy for your MBA? You would have been a great Harvard candidate. You would have been great at Wharton. Um, and most of the time, my response isn't this arrogant, but sometimes I get a little arrogant, and say, um, Prudential's 150 years old, right? In that 150 year history, I'm the youngest director of Prudential ever. Not youngest black, not youngest woman, just youngest. That title does not belong to someone that went to an Ivy League. The person right after that is another Hamptonian, Maurice Kirkendall, who is the second youngest director. So when you talk about, again, a, a financial institution like Prudential that has been around for 150 years, that only, at one point, only employed Ivy League grads and PWI grads, and you look at the talent that is coming through our organization and the way that we are um, empowered to really take control of our careers, and you will see one day a black CEO of Prudential you will see a black CMO of Prudential. You will see us showing up in those spaces. So when people talk to me about Ivy League, I say, just watch. Just, just watch my LinkedIn, and you'll see what's going to happen, and how I and many of my other classmates, peers, and the rest of us will continue to um, carry this torch forward. We're going to have a black governor one day. OK? Uh, I hear you, So at this point, why don't we um, transition? Uh, I think we have some questions from the audience. And um, they collected them. Oh, so they have. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for the time. All right, let's see what we got. Let's see. Okay, so the first one. Okay. Do either of you have a PWI experience you can share that gives a comparison to an HBCU? I do. I do too. <laughs> so um, when I graduated, I decided I wanted to attend um, medical school and become a physician. So I um, 
I left Tuskegee, did my schooling, and went back to Rutgers University Medical School. And it was a eye-opener. I was so used to the environment of nurturing and people supportive, of trying to see me succeed. Whereas when I was at Rutgers, it was too bad. You know, hey, I got my grade, see you later. And so I wasn't used to that, so I had to learn how to adjust an environment that was much more competitive and not supportive. It can be done, it's no problem. You can do it, you can master it, you can do anything. But it's definitely a different environment than it is at an HBCU. Yeah, I went to St. Peter's for grad school in Jersey City, and it was completely and totally different. People think that when you go to Howard, like every, or, or black college, everything is monolithic, but it isn't. We had some lively debates uh, in those classrooms, but the debates were always out of love. Like, you know, you, I could debate with a guy like Kasim or somebody else, and then after that, we go hang out at the punch out. Uh, but, um, you know, at, at St. Peter's, it was different. You know, you would be in class, and you feel like you were actually being attacked. Like, uh, people, you know, we, there was a whole discussion, it was, we, it was about education, a whole discussion about Columbus and, you know, his impact on, on education and Thomas Jefferson, all those folks, and they uphold these people. But I come from a school where we question all of these folks, so it was completely different the way I viewed it and the way they viewed it. And I say something about that and it explodes into a, a tension where people don't even feel like talking anymore. The professor looks uncomfortable. In, in a discussion that's going back and forth. So it makes you feel uncomfortable uh, about what's happening. And I, I went to Howard, so I knew I was telling the truth. I, knew I was talking to <laughs> So you know, we, 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 we would go back and forth. So it, it was definitely, definitely different. You could feel it right away uh, uh, in, in those debates in the classrooms. I think each of you appreciate this next question. Can you share any insight on what a first-generation immigrant student may experience at an HBCU. And, and the person who wrote the question said that they engage um, students from Nigeria and their families, and they're very nervous about how they might fit in. Shouldn't be. Yeah, absolutely not. They have their own, they have student organizations. I mean, uh, the West, student, West Indian student organization was probably the popping this organization on the campus. Everybody wanted to go to the events, the parties, all the things they had. And, and uh, as a matter of fact, when I was at Howard, uh, there was a Jamaican student who was the vice president of the, was the vice president of student government uh, right before we became uh, that. So, I mean, all engaged and involved. You see black people from all over the world, all over the world on those campuses. It's impossible to go to these campuses and not meet a black person from a place you've never even been. You can't even pronounce the name of this place. I met black people who lived in Milwaukee. I didn't know any black people. But Wisconsin, Milwaukee, I don't know where these people come from. But but ultimately, all over the world is black people. You're going to feel comfortable there. You're going to find your group within your group. So like you, my sister, we followed me to Hampton. I don't know why. We're only 19 months apart. But my sister had always had Caucasian friends. She, had, I couldn't understand why she wanted to come to Hampton. Um, my sister likes anime. My sister is a book nerd and like fiction book nerd, like Harry Potter the first day it comes out. Um, and when she came, <laughs> other black nerds, I love it. Um, but when she came to Hampton, my sister found her people, and it, I, I literally watched my sister transform in front of my eyes, and it was the most beautiful thing to see, to watch her mature, to watch her grow up, to watch her be comfortable in her blackness, to watch her be comfortable in being a black nerd with other black nerds that watch Japanese anime, and that wear the t-shirts, and that, you know, don't dress like the hot girls, and you know, don't dance when Juvenile comes on, you know, they wanna hear, you know, Paramore or something. Um, and so just to watch, that closely, my sister, who, again, I've never seen my sister have black friends. And she came and she found her community within the community and it's beautiful to see, so they'll be fine. Yeah, I agree. Um, there is a community for every person at a black college, every single one. And so I always tell my friends whose kids are deciding about HBCUs, don't worry about them, her, they'll be fine. They'll find somebody, no matter where you're from, it's always there, everybody. Your group is on that campus. Somewhere. Your group is there. They're waiting for They're you. They're on that yard. And they have parties every Friday, and they got fundraisers, and they do giveaways and community service, and it's wonderful. Yeah, it's great. 
So this is a good one. I like this question. What do you think educators in the city of Newark can do to strengthen the pipeline to HBCUs? First, put some flags up. You know, every time I go to these high schools, I see these flags of all these schools, and I'm looking for HBCUs, and I can't find them. I'm like, you don't know that this HBCU exists? Like, all over the, you go around and they have all these Ivy League schools, because in our mind, there's a little voice in us that's telling us the Ivy League schools are the best, right, schools. And we refuse to put up uh, these, these things. There was a shirt we used to wear at Howard, and it said, because people used to say Howard was the black Harvard, and we had the opposite shirt. Harvard is the white Howard. Oh. We used to have that shirt, and we would wear that because, listen, at, at the end of the day, we are excellent. Yes. And it's important to, to show all the kids that. Now, I know somebody in the audience that runs an elementary school that has the HBCU flags all over. Dr. Lefferts in the We have it at our charter school, too. It's How about that? I think it's having conversations. It, it, it took just my best friend talking about her brother going to a and for me to be like, oh yeah, I want to go and do that. Um, so having conversations and then wear your Nelia. I wear my Hampton Nelia all the time. I wear Delta Nelia all the time because I need, I, I live in this community. I want kids in this community when they walk into Chipotle to see Hampton. I want when we're at Whole Foods for them to see Delta. And it's not just for enough for, it's great for it to be in the, in the school place, but when you walk around and see people that look like you, they're in spaces you want to be in. You know, getting out of a nice car with a Hampton shirt on. Getting out, you know, walking out of a nice house or wearing some nice sneakers with a Howard shirt on. Like that, you have to live it. We have to walk in it and be it. But I also think it's important that we expose the teachers because maybe they just don't even know how to explain it to the students and to how to present it to them. So we also need to make sure that the teachers, especially in Newark, are aware of these opportunities for these young people because it's not for every young child to go to an H a PWI, but they can do well and succeed at an HBCU. So if we can just expose more of the, our teachers to that as well, that will make a difference. And a lot of our local sororities and fraternities, we have HBCU bus rides. I know yeah. North Jersey alumni chapter. We put one on every year. You can join, I'm, again, I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk only Delta Talk right now. If you have your children joining Embody, which is a program for young men, if you have your children joining Delta Gems or Delta Teen Lift, they are going to kind of get that exposure organically, but tap into what's going on with your local fraternities and sororities, because I guarantee you every single local chapter has a bus ride down to HBCUs. So this is a good one, and I, I need to put a little context here. So uh, we have a young person in the audience, um, the age of eight, and this question is, how did you get into college? So I'd like each of you to kind of tailor an answer to that young person. I, I, I don't know. I, 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 kind of, I mean, I just worked real hard. I studied hard from, you know, single digit ages all the way through high school. Just worked extremely hard and knew what I wanted to do and knew that I needed to excel and do well to get into college. And so that was what I did. Now, I didn't have a super strong GPA coming out of high school. I was one of those kids, I still am one of those kids, that is smart, but I don't apply myself. Um, so I came up with like a, you know, an average GPA, but I was extremely involved in my community. Um, I was involved in a women's scholarship club in Cotillions. I had always volunteered with local fraternities and sororities. I had always participated in Juneteenth events. From when I was a kid, I was very active in my church. So I had a very well-rounded application. Um, so it's not just about the grades. So even, if you, even if you don't have the best grades or 4.0, 4 there are other things that you can add. So I wish I could see the needle, but there are other things that you can do and start doing now. My mom had me in Women's Scholarship Club Cotillion since I was like eight, and that was a big piece of the interview that I talked about um, and when I was interviewing to go to Hampton. So community involvement is very important. Probably more important, I think, than GPA for HBCUs. They want well-rounded students. Well, I, I was committed, and I would say that, and so uh, I would try to figure out 
even at eight years old, nine, ten, when you get older, begin to figure out what it is that you are interested in, what you want to do, and commit yourself to it. I was, I was uh, completely committed to Howard University. Uh, I wanted to go to school there, and I told you I don't want to, don't copy what I did. I filled out one college application uh, because that's where I, in my mind, I was going to be. I mean, that's how I'm a determined kind of individual like that too, no plan B type of guy. So I, I wanted to make sure uh, that I made that happen for myself. So I worked at it, I worked at it, I worked at it. did everything I needed to do uh, in order for it to happen. I think what I would offer um, in addition um, to what you just heard to that young person is, first I would say, in all of your classes and while you're in school, the expectation first is that you always do your best. Always do your best. The second thing that I would offer is, just as you're participating in this panel discussion and a part of it today, make up your mind today that you are going to college. Yeah. If you're doing your best and making up your mind that you are going to college, you'll get into college as well. You'll get into college as well. So at this time, I really want to take a moment and thank all of our panelists for participating. This is a great discussion, and we need to have many, many more of them. Um, but I'd like to offer each of you uh, to be able to make some closing remarks. Yes. <laughs> you know, just quickly, I just, just to close out, I just, I think it is important to know that you see us up here, you see yourself. Where we are and where we have been is the same place you can go. So look at what we have brought to you today as an example of the next step that you will be in. So I can't wait to see where you will be, what you will choose, and when I can read about you. Um, uh, reach back while climbing. I'm gonna double tap on that just again. For everyone, the closing remark, all of us in here have a job to do to proactively reach back to the generations that are coming up behind us and to make decisions that will empower them to um, speak up to be a part of the positive part of our system that helps our young black and brown children get to whether it be HBCUs, PWIs, Ivy League, wherever. Um, but take that charge personal. I take the charge very personal to support HBCUs. And we talked about delivering money. We've delivered over $2.5 million in Hampton in the last three years. And so that is from alumni being in the room and saying, no, 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 no. Y'all not giving no more money to Rutgers, respectfully. How do we take a percentage of that? How do we take a piece of that and spread the wealth among HBCUs um, to be able to, again, empower that next set? So just, again, take reaching back while climbing seriously. Take it a personal charge. I want to see all the young Amelia around Newark and around New Jersey and just pouring into the next generation because they will only be what we give to them. I would say legacy, uh, more than anything, we just watched this film and you saw those kids and sitting in, the first sit-in was started in 1961 by students from North Carolina A&T. Ezell Blair, Frank McCain, David Richmond, Joseph McNeil. I know those people because I studied at Orleans Bingard in that library downstairs. Uh, but at the, at the end of the day, uh, these universities were put up for a reason it would put up because we would deny the opportunity to get a quality education. That's the reason they exist. James Baldwin said, the reason that we have to think we're black is because you insist on being white. Mm -hmm. So at the, at the end of the day, these universities are there specifically for us, yep. and we need to fill them up yep. as much as we can with enough people that can come out of there and transform these communities and make this place better than what it is in the present. Spreading the word about HBCUs. Let's make sure our children, grandchildren, nieces and nephews uh, uh, 
children in the neighborhood know about HBCUs. Let's spread the word. The other thing that we need to do, we need to be more philanthropic to our HBCUs. We need to make sure that they are funded so that they can exist for the next hundred plus years and the next generations behind us. We want some of our children, some of our neighbor's children, to be in the next documentary about the second 150 years of, of HBCUs, right? So, so it's real important. So with that, I thank everybody and I'm gonna ask Mr. Donald Walker to come back to the stage, please. Thank you so much. This is an absolutely incredible, wonderful, wonderful audience.